Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 166 of Analyzing Evil. My name is Matt. What the f*** was that? I don't know, man. Anyway, our featured topic for this episode is going to be our patron pick for January 2024, The Jungler. Seriously, man. What, what is that? J just stop, okay? I'm not doing anything, man. I'm not doing anything. Whatever. What, whatever. All right. So again, this video features our patron pick for 2024, the Joker from the Arkham series of games, voiced by Mark Hamill in one of his best performances as this character. This version of the Joker, and nearly every other version of him, has captivated audiences since its inception, often ranking among the best portrayals of the character ever created. And in this video, we're going to find out how this Joker stacks up against his counterparts in terms of villainy by delving into every bit of information that I could dig up on his character. Now you might be wondering what I mean by all the information I could find on him, as canon in the Arkhamverse is subject to heavy debate. And if you're a purist, it's pretty much the games that are the only officially canon parts of this story. However, all the material that's been created as tie-ins to the games provide us with a lot more information about the Joker that greatly enhances his character. So in this video, I've taken every piece of Arkham-related media into account when analyzing this version of the Joker. And those materials are of course the four mainline Arkham games, Arkham Origins Blackgate, Arkham VR, The Assault on Arkham Film, and the following comics, Road to Arkham, Arkham City, Arkham Unhinged, Arkham City Endgame, Arkham Origins, Arkham Knight, and Arkham Knight Genesis. Now with all that out of the way, let's begin. As far as an origin story for the Joker is concerned in this version of his story, there is no single concrete answer. However, there are several indicators we're given in Arkham Origins that point to the Joker having a similar origin story to the Joker we can find in The Killing Joke. And I was better educated on these similarities through a question that was answered over on Quora by a user named Yan Chung Lung. So if you're watching this, thanks Yan. In The Killing Joke, it's revealed that the Joker was once a lab assistant who decided to quit his job and try his luck at becoming a comedian, while also being a married man with a child on the way. Unfortunately for pre-Joker Joker, he apparently wasn't the greatest comedian, and his dream was quickly becoming an untenable profession that was bound to leave him and his pregnant wife destitute sooner rather than later. In his desperation, he chose to sign up for a heist with the Red Hood Gang, which involved the robbery of a playing card factory that stood adjacent to his old place of work at the Ace Chemical Company, a heist that he was convinced that he was a crucial part of, but his part in actuality was one of the tour guide and the fall guy, the man that this gang would throw to the wolves should they be ambushed by law enforcement, or worse. Unfortunately for this clown-to-be, his wife would perish in an accident the day of the heist, along with his unborn child. But the tragedy of this fateful day was far from over. The criminals he had signed up with were not so willing to let their new patsy off the hook just because his entire world was collapsing, and they forced this grieving father and husband to accompany them on the robbery, regardless of his pain. Unfortunately for the gang, there was a new security detail working the chemical plant, and as he tends to, Batman made an appearance during the robbery and put a stop to their heist. And spurred on by the overwhelming despair he had experienced as of late, our unnamed man chose to toss himself over a railing into chemically polluted waters rather than submit to the punishment Batman had in store for him, which permanently disfigured him and gifted him the Joker's signature chalk white skin, green hair, and deadly red grin. A man who was thrown over the edge of sanity because of just one bad day. Or more appropriately, one bad day that served as the igniter for a life already in decline. Now the sequence we're given in Arkham Origins is slightly different, as the Joker is pushed into a vat of chemicals rather than jumping of his own volition into a polluted chemical outlet. But in the side-by-side -side comparison you've been seeing on screen, it's pretty clear where the creators of this series drew their inspiration from regarding his origin. But even in The Killing Joke, the Joker admits he has a hard time remembering just exactly what happened to him. And in the Arkham City comics, he even explains that he's some sort of alien sent here from another planet when he was a baby, a la Superman. But there's actually two more indicators that the Joker's origins in the Arkham Universe is the same one that we find in The Killing Joke. When Batman is infiltrating the Joker's headquarters at the Gotham Royal Hotel in Arkham Origins, he finds that the Joker has converted this sprawling complex into a macabre amusement park, one filled with deadly rides and whimsical torture devices, complete with victims. And when the Joker is talking to Batman about the renovations he's made, he has this to say. amusement park. Oh, you should have seen the look on the real estate agent's face when we shook hands on the deal. <laughs> 
Now, this might seem like just another one of the Joker's off-colored remarks, but it's actually a reference to the killing joke. As in this story, we see the Joker purchasing an abandoned amusement park from its owner. And after they've shook hands and sealed the deal, we see that the Joker had poisoned the man with a needle he had strapped to his palm, causing him to perish and leaving him with this horrific look on his face. So this line that we receive in Origins is undoubtedly a direct reference to this sequence, but we have further evidence for this theory that comes straight from the Joker's mouth when Dr. Hugo Strange is interviewing him in Arkham City. I think it is time for you to do something for me. <laughs> Name it, Doc. Tell me how you came to be. Explain what made you what you are today. How you come to be sitting across the table from me, dying. Is that all? Well, I guess you could say I once had a very bad day. Really? Go on. It was a Thursday night. Things had been getting worse. I was three days from the bank foreclosing on my home. The chemical plant I worked nights at was about to lay off half the workforce. And I was sitting in the hospital, holding the hand of my pregnant wife, wishing to God that she wasn't dead. That must have been upsetting for you. Probably was. Back then, though, all I knew was that if I didn't let old man Falcone's men into the plant that night, they'd have killed me, too. So here's the thing. I had to decide. Could I live without her? Was there any point going on? I've got to admit it. I was scared. Not of being dead, you understand. No one would blame you if you were. It is perfectly common. Do I look common? No. I was scared of the part just before you die, when you don't know what is about to happen, when you're desperately clutching at life and trying to hold on with slippery, blood-covered hands. So I made a decision right there. And what was that? That? Well, that... <laughs> is a story for another day, strange. I think I may need to see a doctor. Get me one. You were telling me about the night your wife died. Oh, no, Hugo. As I recall, I was waiting for you to send me another doctor. We both know I have sent you three more doctors. Did you? Yes. One was left dismembered outside the elevator to my office. The other two have not been seen since they were sent to you. How careless. Listen, Doc. Professor. Okay, Professor. I'll give you a little more. I just hope you're taking notes. It's the day after, and I'm standing in the freezing rain, just staring at the chemical plant, feeling numb. Jeannie was dead. It didn't seem real. I can remember the day I first met her, her infectious smile as I told her bad joke after bad joke, how even after living with the pathetic wretch I was, she still wanted my child. And then they arrived. <laughs> Reality's way of yanking me another wedgie. Falcone's men told me to cheer up. He said, things could be worse. I asked him how. He grabbed me by the collar, pulled me close. He'd been eating garlic, and each word stank as he threatened to perform oral surgery on me with a nail and a brick. A creative guy. They hand me a box. I remember thinking it was heavy. Was it a bomb? A gun? I'd never used a gun before. Were they that heavy? And what was in the box? How's that doctor coming along? I'll get you one. And when you do, I'll tell you the rest. You are looking a little better, yes. Well, I have my good days and bad days, but I do try and start each one with a smile. <laughs> are you ready to continue your story? Yeah, why not? So where was I? The box. Ah, yes, the box. <laughs> so there I was, tearing open this box, expecting the worst. And all it had in it was a crazy red dome and a cloak. <laughs> ah, I thought they were having a joke with me, but oh no. 
They made me put it on. They said it was a disguise. It would keep me safe. It smelled like garlic. And that was it, really. I was dressed up like a spaceman, barely able to see, trying to break into the one place in this town that had given me a job. Have you ever tried to walk with an enormous fishbowl on your head? Don't answer that. It's hard. I couldn't see where I was going. I must have tripped one of the alarms. I heard muffled gunfire. I panicked and tried to run. And then I saw him. Who? That man. Really? Yes, really. Batman tried to hit me. I moved out of the way, but... Well, what you need to understand is... I had this giant bowl on my head. And I lost my balance. It's like life, really. One minute everything's bad. And the next your wife's dead and you're hanging on for dear life... Suspended over a tank of experimental chemicals. I'm sure he'd say he tried to save me. But we all know he didn't. I fell for a second... Just as I hit the surface, I thought I may just get away with this. I assume that wasn't the case. Do I look like I got away with it? I was drowning. The chemicals were burning my skin. My entire body felt like it was on fire. And it was all his fault. Whose fault? Batman's? Who else? Yours? Come again? Let me tell you what I believe. I believe that you have fabricated a series of events that you use to conceal the truth about your condition. I have read twelve different accounts of your past, all different except for one detail. Batman. What can I say? I like to keep things interesting. A wise man once told me that if you have to have an origin story, you're better off making it multiple choice. And never facing up to the truth of what happened. What you did. How you got here. Oh, I know exactly how I got here. A big truck brought me here from Arkham. You remember the asylum, don't you? Of course. Well, good. Because I'd hate to think that I'd fabricated seeing you watching me in my cell all those times. Excuse me? Hugo, you merry maniac. You were obsessed with me. <laughs> you all were trying to get in here. Next thing you'll tell me, it wasn't you who sent old Sharpie over the edge. Nice work, by the way. Thank you. So here's the thing. If you want to make sure that no one else finds out about your past, you should start poking your nose into mine. Oh, and send me another duck, duck. I think I need a second opinion. So with these three references, it's pretty clear that the creators of this series drew a lot of inspiration for the Joker's origins from The Killing Joke. But again, it's not confirmed that this is the Joker's true backstory, but all indicators do seem to point to the fact that it is. And we're going to consider at the very least, if this isn't truly his backstory, that his backstory does contain some sort of horrific tragedy that made him into who he is. So now that we have this possible origin story in mind, we have a great starting point from which we can explore the Joker's personality, mind, and motivations, so we can better understand why he takes all the horrid actions he takes throughout this series. The Joker has shown us time and time again that his madness doesn't limit his intellectual capabilities, and the method to his unique brand of madness can be found in his overall philosophical outlook on life. And that philosophy can be boiled down to one singular phrase, life is just one big joke. But when applied to the story of the Joker, this common lamentation is given so much more meaning. If we abide by the assumption that the Joker's backstory here is similar to the one we see in The Killing Joke, or if it isn't, then it's at the very least a backstory with a hefty amount of tragedy baked into it, then we know that prior to his transformation, the Joker's life was on a downward spiral into destitution and despair. Therefore, when he fell into that vat of acid, it was not just the events of that one day, as well as his warped appearance that caused him to go insane, but everything leading up to this day compounded with his transformation. This was a man who was failing at achieving his dreams, who then lost his wife and his unborn child in a short span of time. And once he'd lost himself in that vat of acid, the absurdity of all of it only further shattered his mind as these chemicals rapidly changed the makeup of his psyche. And in this moment, this new creature found not only the answer to the meaning of life, but his purpose in that life. 
to become a chaotic criminal jester of madness who would prove his newfound theory that one bad day was all that separated the good men from the bad, becoming a plague upon the world of men, just as the world of men had served as a plague upon his own, drowning them in sorrow and madness as he himself drowns. For if life is just one big joke, then the Joker would become life's punchline, a man whose madness only worsens the memories of strife, hardship, and loss that constantly plague his mind. There is <laughs> There's nothing so cruel as memory. The pointy biting little thunderbolts, unwanted party crashes, screaming for your synapses. <laughs> Inescapable, unrelenting, not at all friendly. You can't even escape into madness. There is no rhyme or reason for why such unfortunate things can happen to a person in quick succession, and the tragedy that can quickly beset anyone in this uncaring universe of ours is a potentially random occurrence that we all are in danger of facing at various points in our lives. When one is faced with such horror, there are several ways their story can continue following these occurrences. You might find a person who takes whatever life throws at them in stride, walking with their head held high, and nary a tear shed. You may find someone who falls into a state of utter despondency, who after some time is able to pick up the pieces of their fractured world and forge themselves anew, the pain they experienced ever present, but slowly lessened as time passes them by. There are an infinite number of possibilities in regard to the direction one's life might take when a person is presented with tragedy, but in this case, for this man, that path unfortunately led to madness. But for a man who was so ready to live his life, to achieve his dreams, and share the fruits of that dream with his burgeoning family, life was still very much in the cards for him. But it was now a life of recklessness, of nihilism, of chaos, of sadism. A life that would be lived without limits, and with an extraordinary amount of excess, debauchery, and hedonism. Gifting us a man who takes his pleasures in whatever dreaded whimsical fancy that might pop into his mind at any moment, and a man who makes extensive and intricate plans to cause as much pain and suffering to a world that shattered his mind as he can. Everything and anything was funny to the Joker, whether it be a simple and inoffensive pun, or the darkest joke you can imagine, the Joker could find humor in everything, and nothing was off the table as long as he could get a good laugh out of it. And the cruelty and barbarity of the Joker was legendary even amongst the other supervillains of Gotham. Now while the Joker chose life after his transformation, he would not hold his own with as much regard as he once had. And if any of the circumstances he manufactured caused him to stare into the eyes of death, he would meet that stare, openly, without flinching. For as much as he wished to live and sow seeds of destruction across Gotham, he wanted to die just as much. Therefore, the Joker lived every moment as if it were his last as if nothing mattered save for the exactment of his own cruel pleasures upon any unfortunate soul who might cross his path, a path that he in some ways felt forced to take. But quite unexpectedly, this man whose purpose was now dredged in chaos was given focus when he met an individual who he shared so many similarities with and yet so many differences, Batman. <laughs> you wanna know something funny? I used to think of fate as evil, predetermined not by some higher power, no, but by the rules of human nature. Tonight, it's all changed. What changed? Have you ever had the feeling that your entire life has been building towards this one moment? Is that how you feel? <laughs> well, now, yes. Now I realize that all the battles, the bad days, the brutalities, it was all the hand of fate at work. So now you see fate differently? <laughs> Absolutely. Now I understand there are no chance encounters. It was all meant to be. Everything leading up to who I've met tonight. Now like the Joker, Batman suffered a day of immense tragedy wherein he lost his parents. And similarly to the Joker, that day of tragedy decided the course that the rest of his life would take. However, instead of his mind focusing on lashing out at a cruel world that took from him that which he loved most, it was instead galvanized against that world and resolved to meet injustice with justice, to protect the lives of every single person living, no matter how innocent or guilty. As the Batman, life is something sacred that is to be cherished, and no one man honorable or otherwise should hold within his hands the power to end another's life in Batman's eyes, lest the world truly devolve into chaos. Batman, like the Joker, is often considered to be insane, but how? How is a man like Batman insane? Well, 
in a way, to be the living embodiment of a strict form of justice is insanity, as to live one's life according to an arbitrary moral code, at the expense of everything else life has to offer, is actually quite insane. As though Batman under the cowl is Bruce Wayne, a man with a life who can live that life in any way he pleases. His whole existence is essentially consumed by his alter ego, and whatever life Bruce does live is typically only lived to further whatever he's trying to achieve as Batman. Insanity isn't just madness. It's behavior that any average person would consider to be extreme, and dedicating one's life to being Batman is quite the extreme thing to do, especially when you consider that in many ways, Batman is his own worst enemy, as his strong sense of morality often contradicts his intended goal of protecting people when the many villains he apprehends inevitably escape and wreak more havoc on the world he's trying to safeguard. I mean, what is he, stupid? Man. In all seriousness though, I'm not saying Batman should be doling out the death penalty with his own hands here, as it's more so the justice system's fault for not dealing with the criminals that they've sentenced in the proper way, as Batman's code is highly admirable, but it still stands that his life is relegated to that of a seemingly endless struggle between himself and the forces of evil because of that code, and it's hard not to see how insane one has to be to willingly perpetuate that cycle. Now what is it exactly about Batman that fascinates the Joker so? Well, because he's a man just like him, who's acting in the complete opposite way that he is. The Joker kills anyone and everyone, just for a laugh. A mass murderer wishing to see the world suffer, as he suffers. Batman will save anyone, no matter how heinous their crimes are. A man who wants to prevent the suffering of others, so they won't have to experience the suffering he experienced. When the Joker realized who Batman is, and what he's about, a couple different things happened. First, it shattered his preconceived notions that someone like him would inevitably turn towards a path of mayhem, destruction, and vengeance. Even more so when he realized that not only was he a do-gooder, but a do-gooder who would even save the lives of the most heinous and wretched creatures walking the earth. But more importantly, it made him realize that he wasn't alone in the world, that there was someone else like him who understood him and shared his pain, and that this person, who stood at the opposite end of all that the Joker represented, had now given his life direction. To continue playing the game he had been playing, yes, but to play it now with a worthy adversary, at which he could direct all his ill intent towards. The emptiness of the chaotic void within his soul, filled to the brim with the prospects of either bringing Batman down to his level, so he might finally prove himself as the one worthy enough to end the life of the Clown Prince of Crime, or killing the Batman, and proving to the world that his brand of immoral madness was superior, that what he is, and what he's become, is ultimately what a person affected by tragedy is reduced to, and that no matter which result he achieved by fighting the the bat, that he was right all along, that there was never any hope for men like them, who had been twisted by all the horrid things that they had experienced, to become anything less than murderers. So while initially, the Joker was committing his atrocities to wreak havoc upon the world, for the sake of punishing the masses through the supreme humor that is carnage and mayhem, after meeting Batman, he instead dedicated his entire existence to dancing macabre with his justiciar counterpart. His newfound friendship with Batman, as he calls it, even caused Joker's suicidal tendencies to subside somewhat. I mentioned earlier that the Joker was often willing to meet death with open arms. However, the Joker showed us several times that he wasn't above trying to save himself after he met Batman as there are situations where we find him attempting to subvert his demise, like when he's trying to find a cure for Titan's effects in Arkham City. But even then, death still isn't something he necessarily fears. It's just something he tries to avoid if he feels that he still has a part to play in the game of cat and mouse that he's constantly engaged in with his rival. But in order to keep playing this game with Batman, the Joker needed to bait him into playing it, and the best way to do that was to continue being the menace that he planned to be. And now that we've gotten a pretty firm grasp on who the Joker is, and what he's about, it's time that we further explore his personality, as we examine his actions, and the skills he employs when taking them, so we can get a good idea of just how evil this man truly is. Now as you can see, chronicling all these things is going to take quite a while, and this is actually the condensed version of everything he's done, as if I were to relay to you in detail everything the Joker has done, we'd likely be here for several hours, but I'm not doing so for a few reasons. One, is that a simple overview of any actions he's taken is more than enough to convey to you the evil that's present within them. Another is that many of you are likely already aware of most of what I'm about to discuss, if you've played the games. However, I'm sure there's still a bevy of information that you might not be aware of if you haven't consumed any Arkham material outside of the games. And last but not least, because what I can convey to you here in words in no way compares to what the games, comics, and film canon images, and in the dialogue you can find within, 
And if you'd like to fully experience all the evil of this version of the Joker, I hope what I'm about to tell you inspires you to experience it all for yourself. One more thing before we continue. There's a whole lot of evil that this man commits throughout all these different stories, and chances are I might have forgotten to include some things here. So if you know of something he's done that I've missed, please let us know down below. Now let's start chronicling his actions from the beginning of his reign of terror. When Joker was just starting to make a name for himself in Gotham, on Christmas Eve no less, he chose to target the criminal operation of Roman Sionis, better known as Black Mask, for a hostile takeover, a quick route to securing for himself the fortune of this crime lord, as well as his personnel, and his drug manufacturing operation at his steel mill, where the Joker could create the chemicals he needed for his toxins, as well as the explosives he'd need to carry out his designs. In order to accomplish this, the Joker, after stealing from the mill and grabbing Roman's attention, infiltrated a safe house that Roman had sent his lover Tiffany Ambrose to hide in, and baited Roman into coming over so he could steal his identity. The Joker ended up murdering a body double that Roman sent ahead of him, and he also forced Roman to make a horrible decision, to let his lover, whom the Joker had tied to a chandelier, burn alive after he threw a Molotov cocktail in the room, or shoot her himself to prevent her suffering. Roman chose the latter. After taking Roman hostage and asserting his position as the false black mask, the Joker murdered several of Roman's thugs, police officers, and security guards at Blackgate Prison when he staged a breakout. In the process, Joker had his thugs kidnap Warden Joseph, and he tortured him up to the point where he burned one of his eyes out of its socket so the warden would ensure that the security the night of the breakout was light. During the breakout as well, the Joker murdered Police Commissioner Loeb by placing him in a gas chamber that was scheduled to execute Calendar Man. Once he'd secured Roman's organization and freed many of Gotham's worst criminals, he first robbed the Gotham Merchants Bank to claim Roman's fortune, in the process poisoning the bank manager with his Joker toxin and causing her to die a maddening death. Then he set his newfound crew to work rigging explosives under a number of Gotham skyscrapers, and he managed to destroy one supposedly unoccupied building, and he also created a massive carnival-like hideout within the Gotham Royal Hotel which we've already discussed. And he also set a $50 million bounty on Batman's head that sent every mercenary and supervillain scrambling to eliminate him. And all of this was done so the Joker might totally secure his power over Gotham within the span of a day. He was of course prevented from doing so and sent back to Blackgate. But once he arrived, he commandeered the prison for himself and set up a cruel game wherein Batman had to fight Bane while Joker sat in an electric chair that would activate if Batman didn't kill Bane in time, guaranteeing that at least one of them would die by the end of the fight. But Batman figured a way to get out of that without killing anyone. And as far as we know, no one was hurt in the explosion the Joker managed to trigger. And Batman survived the many attempts on his life that came as a result of the bounty. But the mayhem that the Joker caused during his power struggle with Batman caused the deaths of dozens, if not hundreds of people. This is the first canonical example we're given of just how extraordinarily intelligent and resourceful the Joker is, as his plans to take down Black Mask, impersonate him successfully, and take full control of his organization so he could gain a massive foothold in Gotham in a short span of time is a brilliant display of diabolical intellect. We're also given our first instance of the Joker's use of torture and psychological torment, as well as his use of manipulation to try and bring people down to his level, all of which highlight the sadism inherent to his character. But one of the most sinister things the Joker managed to accomplish during this time period was the successful seduction of one Dr. Harleen Quinzel to his side, which he didn't really mean to accomplish, considering that Harley became enamored with the Joker of her own accord and assumed he was talking about her when he was telling her that he had met someone special the night he met her. But it's one that he certainly wrote out to completion once he realized he could transform her into the most loyal servant he ever had, highlighting how magnanimous the Joker's personality can be when exposed to the right individuals, and once again, how skilled of a manipulator he is. Now I'd like to take a moment to discuss the Joker and Harley's relationship before we continue chronicling his misdeeds. As valued as Harley is to the Joker, he treats her about as well as he treats any of the other thugs in his employ, perhaps even worse. The Joker is constantly seen berating Harley, making fun of her, using her as bait in any number of his schemes, or harming her physically and mentally, including one instance where he pushed her out of a moving car when they were making a getaway to distract his pursuers, and he seems to care for her only so far as she's useful to him. There may be some sort of genuine affection that he feels for her, as during the events of Assault on Arkham, the Joker is shown to be distraught over Harley's foray with Deadshot, and he even tried to kill him later on for touching his stuff. But on the whole, Harley is little more than an abused dog, happily scampering back to her master due to sheer unrequited blind love. Love that's transformed her into a madwoman, eternally pining after the Joker, no matter how harmful this relationship is to her. There are many more crimes we're going to discuss that far outweigh his treatment of Harley in terms of evil. But it's still very much worth noting 
that the toxic relationship that the Joker has created with Harley can be considered one of the worst things he's ever done, the total destruction and malformation of the life of another into a female version of himself for the sake of his own designs, and of course, for the laughs it brings him. Now after being defeated by Batman at the end of Arkham Origins, the Joker along with Black Mask and Penguin took advantage of a riot that occurred at Blackgate during the events of Arkham Origins Blackgate, and each of them took control of separate sections of the prison. The Joker planned to use small doses of modified riot gas here to control the minds of the inmates so he could create for himself an army of loyal minions that could set him free from prison and allow him to wreak havoc upon Gotham, which seems to have been a precursor to a plan he would formulate later on. But of course, he failed in this endeavor, and Batman knocked him unconscious. But after he killed two guards, who came to return him to his cell, he managed to escape Blackgate once again, dressed as a guard. In the comic Arkham Unhinged, sometime after his escape from Blackgate, the Joker was invited to the opening night at the Penguin's Iceberg Lounge. Here the Joker killed a waitress by spraying acid on her face from the flower on his lapel after she accidentally spilled a bottle of wine on him. And a few weeks later, he tried to return to the club, and finding his name absent from the guest list, he chose to shoot the bouncer before he was kicked out of the club by the Penguin. While these two crimes aren't the worst things the Joker has done, they do highlight something important about his character, that whether as an excuse to get a sinister laugh, or out of genuine animosity, the Joker is not so forgiving when it comes to being slighted, and he's liable to murder anyone for the smallest mistake or for insulting him in any way. Sometime later, Joker heard a tale about the Abramovici twins, a pair of conjoined twins whose brutality was legendary that were abandoned by their father who were now employed as circus freaks. The Joker went to their circus and murdered their ringleader to acquire them, after which he had them surgically separated so he could better use one of them as his most valued enforcer, ordering Harley to get rid of the other by tossing him into the river to die, which she didn't do, but this whole ordeal is quite the horrifying sequence, and it further emphasizes the sadism and wanton cruelty that the Joker is capable of. We learn in the Arkham City Endgame comic that perhaps later on that year, on the 4th of July, the Joker concocted a plan to cause a blackout in Gotham and then set off fireworks that contained a powdered version of his Joker toxin. Batman managed to apprehend him after tracing the source of the power outage to the Joker, but even though he was quite literally dragging the Joker back to Arkham, the Joker still succeeded in seeing his plans come to fruition, and many people beneath the fireworks explosion perished nearly instantly, while many more would die shortly after, as the toxin was carried on the wind throughout the city, an event that caused hundreds of deaths. A notable occurrence during this scenario is the Joker's penmanship of his diary, which he wrote after Batman suggested he write a book, after the Joker asked what he should do with himself, when Batman threw him into a cell deep within Arkham. And this diary is just a long list of the people that the Joker has killed over the years. This shows us that even when faced with the opportunity to leave something behind after he's gone, the Joker still just wants to have the last laugh, bequeathing the world with a final token of terror that in so many words conveys one thing to us. Look at all that I've done to you. Isn't it wonderful? Now while his fireworks scheme was quite the terrifying feat, we've now arrived at what I consider to be the most sickening thing the Joker did over the course of this series, the torture of Jason Todd, and the action that caused Jason to fall into his grasp in the first place. In Arkham Knight, and in the comic Arkham Knight Genesis, we're given an account of what happened to Jason leading up to and during his imprisonment by the Joker. But in the city story titled The Fall, we're given quite the detailed account of what caused Jason to go after the Joker in the first place. I would like to read this story to you, but considering how graphic it is, I fear that it's probably not exactly YouTube friendly. So there's a link to the city stories page of the Arkham Wiki in the description where you can read it for yourself if you'd like to. But I will tell you as plainly as I can what happened in that story. Jason got fed up with Batman's approach to justice and decided to pursue his own brand, which led him to pursuing the Joker after he had kidnapped an entire kindergarten class and promised to return them back in one piece, which he did, stitched together, after he killed them. Following this gruesome act, the Joker would proceed to torture the captured Jason Todd for months, subjecting him to beatings, a branding, and psychological torment until he finally broke him, turning him into the dreaded Arkham Knight a man whose mind had been shattered and forced to focus on exacting his revenge on a Batman who he now believed abandoned him and left him to die. What this series of events lays out for us is something that we might have pondered up until this point, that being the question of whether the Joker has his limits as far as committing atrocities is concerned. But with the knowledge of these crimes, I believe the answer to that is a resounding no, and that answer becomes even more concrete when you consider perhaps the second most personally horrific thing the Joker has ever done, the manipulation of Edward Burke. At the time the Joker was introduced to Harley's old friend Edward Burke under the alias Jack White, he had become interested in the Titan project of one Dr. Penelope Young after he'd been introduced to her. 
While Jack White manipulated Edward Burke into constructing an amusement park for his daughter Katie, he also began sending funds to Dr. Young as the primary benefactor furthering the Titan project. Before Edward could take his daughter to her new park, she unfortunately fell ill with an incurable disease. On the advice of his good friend Jack White, Edward chose to have his daughter treated by Dr. Young by signing her up to become a test subject for Project Titan. During her treatment, Katie only got worse, and she quickly perished due to the negative effects of the prototype Titan serum, combined with the disease ravaging her body. While much of what I've just described to you is given to us through audio files that can be found during the Arkham Knights A Matter of Family DLC, I think it's important that you listen to what happened to Edward following his daughter's demise to understand just how messed up the Joker's treatment of him was. Katie died before she could see the park. Jack blamed me and said I should never have taken her to Gotham General in the first place. But, but how was I to know? He told Dr. Young to triple the dosage of her alternative meds, but that only seemed to make things worse. She died last week, and the pain is unbearable. Dr. Quinzel says it won't get better. She says the pain will just get worse and that there's no point in going on. She's right. She, she always is. I signed the park over to Jack, and uh, my only hope is that he does something inspiring with it. As for me, I'll, I'll be with Katie soon. These pills Jack gave me will make sure of that. You're supposed to be painless. Yes, you heard that correctly. Not only did the Joker convince this man to construct an amusement park for him that he could use for his own nefarious purposes, but he convinced him to allow Dr. Young to test the Titan serum on his daughter, and when she perished as a result of these tests, he had Harley convince him that he should end it all by taking pills that were filled with his signature Joker toxin. And the horror-laced laugh that you heard at the end of that recording should be more than enough to convey to you just how abhorrent this act was. Now, not long after this, the Joker would lure Batgirl and Robin to his amusement park to rescue a kidnapped Commissioner Gordon subjecting all three of them to threats of bodily harm that could have easily killed all three of them. But as usual, they got away. However, this wouldn't be the last time that the Joker tried to ruin the life of Jim Gordon, and sometime after this attempt, he'd track down Gordon's place of residence and shoot his daughter Barbara through the spine, paralyzing her from the waist down and rendering her covert lifestyle as Batgirl obsolete. During the events of Assault on Arkham, the Joker is once again locked away in Arkham and manages to free himself due to Harley shooting a hole in the wall of his cell. And when he gets out, he proceeds to reclaim a radioactive bomb he had stolen that he had concealed in Harley's mallet and threatens to detonate that bomb before he's stopped by Deadshot, which could have potentially irradiated large portions of Gotham and ended, or harmed, thousands of lives. Sometime after Joker survived his attempted incapacitation by Deadshot, during the course of Arkham Asylum and the comic Road to Arkham, Joker finally made his move to put to use the Titan serum we discussed earlier, an incomplete product that rather than providing subjects with any sort of cure for their respective ailments, instead, in a similar fashion to the venom that Bane used to enhance his physique, which the serum was derived from, greatly enhanced their strength. Only instead of fueling the subject's muscles and leaving their mind intact, the Titan serum turned the host into a mindless monstrosity, and the Joker forced Dr. Young to hand over to him this incomplete product so he could begin making plans to transform the inmates at Arkham into an army consisting of a thousand Banes that he would lose throughout Gotham. In order to accomplish this, he obtained the blueprints for Blackgate and set a fire to it that so severely damaged it that the Gotham police force was forced to relocate all of his incarcerated henchmen to the Arkham Asylum. Once that was accomplished, during the events of Road to Arkham on the 4th of July, he stormed City Hall, kidnapped the mayor, and strapped a bomb to his chest before tying him to a radio tower where he planned to blow him up using patriotic-themed chemicals. 
but the whole ordeal was only a ruse to draw out Batman, who could then apprehend him and take him to Arkham, where the rest of his crew lay waiting for him. Once the Joker was checked back into Arkham, he proceeded to unleash havoc and mayhem, having multiple inmates transformed into Titan monstrosities, murdering several of the staff, as well as his own thugs and other inmates, and orchestrating the torture of Dr. Young by Victor Zaz, all with the intended purpose of reducing Gotham to a haven of maniac monsters, should he be allowed to break out with the Titan formula in hand. The Joker was defeated by Batman before this could happen, but not before he infected himself with the Titan Serum in a last-ditch attempt to fight off the Dark Knight, a choice that he would end up paying dearly for. In the run-up to the events of Arkham City that we can find in the Arkham City comic, the Joker was once again interred at Arkham Asylum, but not for long, as Harley Quinn staged his breakout and the pair made their way to the unopened Arkham City, the first villainous duo to do so, and they established their foothold in their old headquarters at Roman Sionis' steel mill. The Joker set about recruiting fresh faces to bolster his forces, and he began bringing doctors to his hideout, who might be able to help cure him of Titan's negative effects, all of whom he would end up killing, and in the process, he had to contend with the forced treatment of Doctor Strange, along with murdering several doctors that Strange had recruited to treat him. And once he had managed to gain a sizable foothold in Arkham City, he also had to struggle with Doctor Strange's army on a daily basis. Doctor Strange had recruited Mr. Freeze to manufacture chemicals and medicines for him by holding his wife Nora hostage, and seeing a way to rid himself of the negative effects of the Titan Serum, the Joker sought to capture Freeze and force him to make a cure for him. Thus ensued a struggle between the Joker, the combined forces of the Penguin and Doctor Strange, and anyone else who stood in his way, and in his efforts to escape the intended eradication of all the criminals present in Arkham City, once Strange and Ra's al Ghul enacted Protocol 10, the Joker had his army construct tunnels beneath the city where they could retreat to while war was being fought up above emerging once the smoke had settled to assert their supremacy over Gotham. By the time Arkham City finally officially opened, the Joker had already made his mark by torturing and killing hundreds at the terror carnival he had created at the steel mill, and over the course of the events of this story, it would be revealed that the Joker was looking to not only cure himself, but find the Lazarus Pit and make himself immortal so he might transform himself into some quasi-clown god who would reign over Gotham City as lord of all its citizens, some of which would become Jokers as well, as the Joker had sent his blood to the various hospitals in the area, which had unfortunately been administered to several patients, causing them to slowly transform into Joker-like creatures. However, this time, rather than just being stopped by Batman, the Joker would meet his ultimate end, as his body could no longer withstand the negative effects of Titan, but not before he had once again ended several lives, including that of Batman's on and off again lover, Talia al Ghul. But though this was the end for the Joker, it was not the end for his machinations. The day after his death, when his body was being examined by two doctors, they discovered a box containing a flash drive that had the words do not open till Xmas written on it. And when they tried to remove said box, a trap triggered that unleashed a cloud of poisonous gas, which killed both doctors. Commissioner Gordon reasoned that the Joker was just as dangerous alive as he was dead. And he chose to move the Joker's body to an undisclosed location that was known only to Batman. However, that would prove to be a fruitless endeavor, as it was not just the Joker's body that one needed to be wary of, but his waning influence in Gotham. There was of course Harley, who continued her lover's legacy and honored his memory by creating a statue of him at the steel mill, after which she kidnapped several officers and even Batman himself before planning to blow them all to smithereens so she could be with her beloved once more. But the final act of the actual Joker was releasing a recording he had made prior to his death that urged the citizens of Gotham to find his body and return it to Harley Quinn to receive a $100 million bounty. And if they didn't, he promised that multiple bombs he had laid about the walls of Arkham City would trigger and unleash the remaining criminals onto the streets of Gotham to run amok. While no one managed to claim said bounty, doubtless dozens if not hundreds of people suffered as citizens from all walks of life scrambled to find the Joker's body. And who knows how many people lost their lives as anarchy once again descended upon Gotham City in the wake of the Joker's demise. But the Joker, during the events of Arkham City, had infected Batman with his blood as well, and Batman was now experiencing hallucinations of the Joker, which aren't really the Joker, but this was still one more horrific thing that he managed to accomplish. The extreme distress of Bruce Wayne, as the effects of his blood ravaged his mind and plagued him with unending taunts and jests, which he could not simply end with his fists. Though in the end, Bruce managed to free himself of the Joker's influence once and for all, but we'll touch on that a bit later. So to recap, we have a man whose rap sheet includes the following crimes. Murder, mass murder, torture, mutilation, terrorism, destruction of property, coercion, bribery, manipulation, and robbery and theft on a massive scale. And hell, you can take it a step further if you count this lengthy rap sheet that can be found in the Arkham VR game. Deceased. Previous convictions include kidnapping, torture, extortion, racketeering, fraud, grave robbing, unlicensed dentistry, counterfeiting, bullying, 
cyberbullying, badger baiting, bear baiting, duck baiting, wildlife smuggling, monkey baiting, iguana baiting, rhino baiting, failure to adequately restrain a rhino, identity theft, malicious mischief, trespassing, arson, assault, larceny, grand larceny, spectacular larceny, vandalism, forgery, impersonating a police officer, impersonating a doctor, <laughs> impersonating an airline pilot, unlicensed cabaret entertainment, theft of livestock, unlicensed taxidermy, involuntary manslaughter, voluntary manslaughter, enthusiastic manslaughter, desecration of a corpse, improper disposition of a body, improper labeling of meat products, cannibalism, homicide, regicide, attempted homicide, littering, so everything that we've discussed so far is essentially who the Joker is and what gruesome things he managed to accomplish during his reign of terror over Gotham. But you'll notice that I've glossed over something that might seem pretty significant to his character, his appearances in Arkham Knight. Well, that's because though I'm sure in some way what Batman is experiencing through his hallucinations contains the essence of who the Joker is. In reality, they are just hallucinations and not the actual Joker himself. However, there is a point at the end of the game where the virus-like Joker manages to take control of Batman's mind, and within, we find something that we haven't discussed yet, the Joker's only fear. And while again this is a hallucination, it seems what we're given here can probably be applied to the actual Joker's character. In Batman's mind, the Joker takes a fictionalized tour of the aftermath of his death. We see him visiting his grave, only to find it untended, overgrown, and vandalized. We then see him viewing the mourning of Harley Quinn, the only person who actually mourns his passing, and then the outrage he expresses over the simplicity of his wake. After this, the Joker goes on to see headlines and hear radio broadcasts that declare that Gotham has all but forgotten him, and that even Harley is preparing to marry the Riddler. In this sequence, we see that the Joker is distraught over learning that no one is going to remember him after he's gone, his only true fear finally surfacing once the reality of who he is and what he's trying to accomplish sets in. That his entire identity is tied to events that people naturally want to forget. Nobody wants to remember the tragedy they faced. No one wants to fixate on a mad clown gleefully rampaging through their city and harming them or taking the lives of their loved ones. These things will pop into a person's memory often, but only for a moment. A passing pain that signifies a time gone by and a wound that's healed. And that is what the Joker was always destined to become. Just a bad and long forgotten memory. Like the memories he had of his own unfortunate beginnings as this manic clown. But unlike the Joker, people can and will forget. And though his lasting influence will surely play Gotham for years to come following his death, one day, no one will remember the exploits of a broken man seeking to break the world in return, save in passing only. For that is who the Joker truly was. Beneath all the dark humor, sadism, brutality, and mania, he was a man who, in all that he did was saying, Hey, look at me. Look what you've done to me. And look what I've done to you in return. You will remember the pain I've inflicted upon you, just as I remember all the pain inflicted upon me. And that will be both your legacy and mine. A lesson to you of what horror the world can produce when it inflicts horror upon one of its own. And an example of what just a simple push over the edge can do to someone. So this is who the Joker in this story was. A madman driven to madness by the unfortunate circumstances of his life and his own decisions. Nihilistic chaos made flesh that sought to ruin everything that he touched. And while there's certainly sympathy to be found in his character, there is no amount of tragedy a person can experience that can excuse the many horrific things the Joker did or influenced, which is likely worse than anything any other villain in Gotham's history could have ever dreamed of accomplishing. And for our dear clown prince of crime, we have no other choice than to label him and all that he's done as pure evil. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on this version of the Joker? Let me know down below and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, my patrons, and anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and subreddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.